Easter weekend, everybody. I hope that you had a good time. I know it was really different. Um, ours was really different. We didn't spend our family time together as much as you didn't spend your family time together. But you know what? We actually made the best of it. Um, Colton was the recipient of, uh, we would call it the Easter Bunny drop-off, weren't you, Colton? Colton's yeah. over here by the, on the side. This is Deb Wiegers, by the way. I'm here for our Thursday live session. And Colton's my IT and uh, everything else you need to be for a moment right now. Yeah, doing it from a distance. So out of the camera view. There was there was good news from Premier Mo. I don't know if anybody saw his address this morning. So, um, But before we go to him, I wanted to tell a story about my little Easter. I didn't get to spend Easter the way I normally, because I'm that gal that goes out and buys all the stuff and hides it throughout the house. And I know my kids are in their 20s, but it's still fun and we always do it. Um, so this year I didn't get to do it, but my daughter took up that uh, challenge. And uh, there was only two of my kids in town. Well, three, I guess, including her. So she went through my house and literally collected anything she thought that remotely looked like it might be Easter stuff, uh, my Easter candles, um, cliff bars. Um, what else did you get, Colton? Soap. Oh, yeah. The um, weird assortment of stuff. Lots yeah. of bars. And yeah. It didn't really make she, but she didn't go shopping. She, she didn't go shopping. She, it was she everything she found in the, house. in the house. Yeah. So she went to their houses. So they both have their own place. And she went and she hid it throughout the yard and, and the deck and everything. And of course, my daughter Toby couldn't find half of hers, so they're on video chat trying to like figure out how we direct her to where it was hidden, and that yeah, was fun. It was fun. So we got to watch a little bit of the Easter, uh, the Easter programming that we would normally take advantage of. So yeah, yeah, it was a nice little surprise. You know, I noticed a lot of people. Uh, we went for a bike ride on, I think it was Sunday, and you saw some people that were standing, you know, down the driveway and chatting with their family from a distance and just doing quick little visits. So I think people kind of got to do a bit of that. So that's nice. Yeah, and we had an opportunity to go out to our, our cabin. It's not a, a very populated cabin, but nonetheless, you saw a few people that were sitting in their garages and visiting with, uh, you know, their immediate family as well. So it was all good. Premier Mo, he had a really good address this morning. I don't know if anybody saw it. Um, um, I think that, you know, what I would think is words of wisdom and um, caution and optimism, uh, but certainly far from being out of the woods. Uh, you know, we're looking that we're getting to a good place, but to his point, uh, there is going to be a very slow uptake on what we might be doing in the next few weeks and months, literally. So I know from our perspective with the various uh, clients and industries that we deal with, we recognize that some are going to be maybe a little bit uh, on the higher uptake than others. Uh, when we look at the hospitality industry, for example, it's going to be pretty tough for them to ramp up and open their doors for you know, a June 28th start date when we know that most of the activities in Saskatoon are shut down. Um, and I know that was one thing Premier Mo did say is that at the end of the day, no big functions. So all those fun things that we would do in the summertime um, certainly have been put on hold. So we're just going to have to make our own fun. And that's OK, too. I'm going to do a little bit of a different uh, twist to our, our event today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit right now. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes. Colton, you're going to flag me when I start to go over. I wanted to just to kind of cover off a couple of the the highlights of the conversations that we never seem to get settled uh, in the insurance world and with our clients. And uh, it has uh, everything to do with people having to go through the layoffs, people having to decide whether they're going to extend the benefits or, or, um, or actually terminate the benefits. Um, but there's kind of three points that just keep coming back that are really concerning people. And, and I'm going to go through a very high level. And I'm here to tell you this. I don't have one answer. I just don't because at the end of the day, we deal with multiple carriers. And even my phone call this morning, um, I realized that there was about four different answers to one question I had. So I'm gonna do my best to give you what we're seeing and hearing, but I'm gonna caution you and I'm going to really encourage you that you need to make a call to your broker or your insurance supplier. We're telling all of our clients, if you're not sure where this is going, pick up the phone and call us. We'll walk you through it because we're still learning along the way. So I wanted to make that very clear. So one of the things that is coming up is now that we're in that phase, because remember the last two or three sessions, we talked about these waves that we're going through. The wave today is the layoff wave, um, the layoff wave and the reduced hours wave. And what should I do um, with my employees as it relates to benefits and how does that impact them? So one of the things that we talked about is that, well, if you're reducing their hours, you may want to think about whether or not you're going to reduce their benefits because it's a correlation of their, their income to the benefit, not health and dental, 
but the life and the disability benefits. Now, that sounds pretty cut and dry, but it's actually not. Um, because what we're hearing is a variance of replies is that if you do reduced hours and you report it to the insurance company as reduced hours, the good thing is the employee pays a reduced income or a reduced premium rather. So that is in light of tight budgets today, that's something that they want. But the downside of it is, is that if the layoff goes or the reduced hours go for a, a length and period of time, what it's going to do is it's going to play into what the benefit would be should they get disabled later. So it's one of those tricky ones that you want to balance it. You want to see, can they afford to pay this premium? Because you want them to keep the benefit. Do you reduce the benefit? But if you reduce the benefit to reduce the premium and it goes too long, then there's a, a risk that later on, if there's a long-term disability claim, for example, they're going to get a bit lesser of a benefit. I hope that makes sense. So a lot of insurance companies are saying, do you know what, if it was me, Deb, I would just hang in there and I would just keep everything at the higher level. In other words, pre the reduced hours, you would just keep it there. So if they had to reduce by 50%, for example, the work day, and they went from 4,000 to 2,000, you would still keep the premium paying on 4,000. Now, one or two months is okay, but again, we have to think, is this affordable to the employee? So where's the balance in that? Um, again, we're saying clients, don't make that decision on your own, call us and we can walk you through it because really there is a, there's a financial issue and there's a moral issue involved. Um, a lot of insurance carriers are saying that, you know what, you, you couldn't allow it to be a little bit more selective to the employee choice. Some insurance companies are saying we want you to do it all for everybody or not do it for everybody. So complicates it again. Um, another thing that comes up is if we start to reduce those hours, which reduces that benefit, there's what's called a non-evidence or a guaranteed level. If we drop below that guaranteed level, the question will be, will your insurance now take a stand that they're going to make those employees re-qualify medically to get back up where they were. Now, some are saying no, some actually don't even have an answer yet. So that's the next push that we're making to the insurance companies. What would happen if it drops below that guaranteed level? And I just qualified for that higher level five months ago, because that's a risk if it goes below. So another thing to keep in mind. Um, the other thing is you got to be careful. If you reduce your hours, you can't go too low because the contracts you have in place have a minimal hour requirement. Most of them would probably be around 20 hours. If you start to drop below the 20 hours, you're now um, you're, you're conflicting what the contract says is eligible for benefits to be uh, given to that employee. So if again, you're not sure what those are, th that is, um, and obviously your booklet would be the first place you go to, your contract, but again, we tell our clients to call us if they're not sure on that level. How am I doing, Colton? Okay, okay. Um, so the other one is, we are talking a lot about trying to manage budgets. We're talking about how can I do that? We unfortunately, and, and I've got many, many dental clients, and I'm sad and sorry to tell you that some people are saying, like, if I have to start to push back, uh, you know, cut back on my costs, um, would it make sense to do the dental? We've said in the past, you know, it probably would, but they're still taking emergency services. That's your risk. If you terminate the benefit or suspend it, if someone should have an abscess tooth, or uh, I know that we just had a situation here with one of my employees, father, um, his tooth mm -hmm. cracked right down the middle. Um, I can't imagine how fun that would be. Um, he'll, he would need now emergency care. The unfortunate thing for him is that when he did get in to get emergency care, um, he was given antibiotics and then he's told he's got to wait months to actually get the procedure done. So that is going to be a bit of a downfall as we start to get into, you know, with the closures of the dental offices. Um, I'm even saying to, to my clients, I said, you know, if I were you, I'd actually start booking now for your dental checkup because we don't know where that's going to be, you know, for a delay in getting in. So if you already were late doing your checkup, I think you might just start, you might want to make a book appointment now. So the emergency care is the one thing that will be the downfall. Now, some people are saying, well, what happens if I suspend my premium for three months, say, um, is the insurance company going to ask me to pay that back? No, they're not. Uh, they are, most of them are just going to pick up where they left off. So when you start the program again, you're going to be paying the premium that you were paying before you suspended. But, because there's always a but, you have to understand this a little bit of, you have to be a voice of reason in there. So if you are that company that has 
lost 75% of your employees. So you've lost a huge volume, but meanwhile, you've had eight months of claiming activity. You know that the premiums are gonna be here and the claims are gonna be here and everything has to realign at renewal. So the question is, are the insurance companies waiting to realign at renewal or are they looking at that really mm -hmm. odd crisis one at that point of reinstatement saying, I think we have to do some number crunching now. So I'm not saying which carriers are and aren't, they're not saying which ones they are or won't make adjustments on. But if it's very, very radical, that shift, um, I don't want my clients to think that it's not going to happen. It's usually going to be on a case by case. And that's again something for us to help negotiate on. Now I know one of the larger associations I work with, um, the chamber, they've made a stance that there will be no adjustments until renewal next year because we've just gone through an april one renewal they're going to hold tight and those adjustments will come back in on renewal now again everything's based on a calculation renewals when we're looking at disability and health benefits it's a ratio of claims and premium if we're out by a great stretch we have to realign so if you need to get a little bit more education on that call me up we can have a coffee because it's pretty deep so I'm not going to go through any more on that. I am going to say shout outs to the virtual care people, uh, the paramedicals. They're really pushing hard to get their services up and running on a virtual care level. Uh, shout out to my clients, Warm and, uh, Warm and Physio uh, Therapy and Wellness, Mackie, Bones, Romney. Um, thank you for making this happen for our clients because there's a lot of people that are in need. And, and Hanif and I had some good conversation on, on working at home and how that's impacting our, our not just mental, but our physical health. So uh, we might touch up, touch on that a bit. And, um, and I'm, I know there's more on the uptake. So we're seeing a lot more of those paramedicals really ramping up to provide those levels of coverage for you. So um, I'm going to do some shout outs on community partners, but I first want to make a stop here because I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, um, a good friend of mine. Um, everybody would know Hanif Hamani as um, the guy with Express Employment, but I know far beyond that. Um, we've used him on a few occasions with the, the, our office and with our team, our management team and our sales team. I feel that his area and his strength, although he's um, a, a rather humble guy, is more in the area of sales and marketing and really working towards that management training and, and that expertise that it gives at that higher level. And in today's world right now through these COVID times, uh, that's a challenge in any day. But right now we're finding that this is really tricky. How are you doing all this stuff from home and how can we make it effective? Is it effective? We don't know if it's effective. How do we measure it? So uh, we, uh, is Hanif there? Yep, right here. Anyway, there's there he is. Take a wave. Hello. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well. Oh. You, you, uh, oh I, think, I think there's some there. Okay. There you go. Thanks yeah. for having me, Deb. Uh, you made me put on a suit jacket after uh, about three weeks here. I uh, know. I know. This is the only day that I actually really dress up. So yeah. I know. And I shaved also. And I shaved also. So. Uh, Good for you. And I'm wearing yeah, And I'm wearing You guys got it lucky, though. I'm telling you, like, I'm, I'm here to, I, I, I'm just throwing it out there for all those women out there saying, like, it's tough looking good through these times. I'm not going to lie. So thank you, Laddie from Hairstyle Inn, who was able to scrounge up some hair dye and actually try and walk me through how to do this on my own. So when he said, just do the roots, uh, by the time I was done, it was all the way down to here. So wow. I hope you like my new hair color. <laughs> well, you know, it looks great. I didn't realize I didn't realize how what a big deal this is for 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 people in general, for women particularly, but even for me. Like I, I've never looked at online how to find out how to cut your hair more more than I have in the last couple of weeks here. So uh, anyway, well, it's, it's for both of us. It, you know what? I got a famous saying. I was going to say it later, but I'm going to say it now because it totally makes sense. Uh, I referenced this book. Last event, the coping crisis. It's on our private chat. Colton will talk a little bit about that. But I love this one liner. Well, it's not a one liner, but it says, It's not the strongest who survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most adaptable to change. True enough. We figured it out, people. We figured it out. So it's not like it couldn't happen. So. There, there were questions from previous before we oh, okay. dive into any of things. I'm testing something new out. So I want to see if the viewers can see. This uh, question. No, I can't Did see it. Read it. Oh, oh, right there. Yeah. Um, 
can there be a process? Yeah, you know, Pam, maybe I can work on what I know that, um, sure, absolutely, I would send it out to, because Pam's a client of mine, so hello. Um, I'm actually, what we did is we actually took all our groups, and I had my team go through everybody that was in that healthcare, serve, uh, virtual care world, and we have touched all of them, and we asked them to let us know as soon as you've got availability for virtual care. So I can send that to you for sure, Pam. I'm looking towards some of the other ones that people are still looking at, you know, um, naturopaths, dietitians. I know I've got a dietitian from my Haley, my, my gal at the physiotherapy. She's got a couple of contracted workers that are in that virtual care space. So we'll get something out to you for sure. Thanks for the question. We can post that as well in the, the private group that we have a link for on this post as well. We've told some people about, so we'll make sure resources like that are put in there. So thanks, Pam, for the question. Yeah. So, so back to, to Hanif. So uh, I, again, should we date ourselves, Hanif? I mean, I, I, he had to remind me, and I had to actually Google it. So yeah, and I'm not the young chick in the crowd. So I'm surprised I missed this one. But he he sent me his his presentation, and he said I'm going to call it because we have these. Thursday live sessions. So he said, I'm going to call mine the must see. I don't know if you can see that. Must see Thursday. Right. And I went, oh, well, that, that's kind of that's kind of creative. And I and I had no idea. And he says, you know where I'm coming from. And I said, no, not really, actually. But people, <laughs> what, what what age would this be? I mean, 50 plus market? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Years, about, about 25 ish. What were those shows? Cheers, friends. Yeah, friends. Uh, it was uh, Must See Thursday. I don't know if you remember all of this, but it was, I think it was Friends and it was um, uh, Seinfeld. And I think it was Mad About You. And I think there was a couple others on Thursday. So they called it, NBC called it Must See, S E E, Thursday. Yeah, clever. Actually, very clever. So, so he's going to take us through the seas. So he's going to talk about, and we'll have some banter, but he'll take the floor um, uh, for the most part. But he's, he's going to address and evaluate the C's that he's seeing in, in his um, world, starting with communication, moving to capital assessment or human capital, as we would know it, moving on to capabilities, moving on to capacity, and moving on to customers. So that would be probably like another 20 minutes of discussion. We'll be definitely open for questions, I'm sure, Anif, during and after. Um, we don't want to lose you halfway through the, the C venture. Um, so I'm going to just, with that, we're going to start on communication, which is quite interesting, Hanif, because that was my last week's session. We talked about communication and the importance of, even what I just talked about today, how incredibly important it is to have this open communication and, uh, and make sure that you're very clear on what the expectation is. And, and the understanding is, and uh, and certainly sometimes if we need to involve the legal aspect of it to make sure that if we're not quite sure, we still got it right. That's important. Communication is going to be critical through these COVID times. How would you see, Hanif, communication rolling into our world of remote work? Perfect. Thank you. So hello, everyone, again. Uh, Col Colton, could you uh, put in that uh, the slide uh, the slide deck uh, inserted into our, our, uh, our visual here, please? Perfect. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Deb. I'll get to that in a second. Like I said, um, uh, must see uh, Thursday. So uh, S E E in this case, it's the letter C in times of COVID. Um, really, what I'm hoping to do is have a have a have a discussion. But it's really it'll be more of a um, more thought provoking than than answer generating, to be honest. And and folks that know me know that. Uh, I like to, I don't give a lot of answers. I tend to ask a lot of questions only because employers know their business best. And so we need to be asking ourselves these questions as it relates to uh, some of these uh, C's um, in, in the age of Corona. So talent management in the time of coronavirus, what can we do as managers? What can we do as leaders? What can we do as business leaders right now? And to take the time now to uh, plan and address as we, as we move forward. So that's really the intent of the next, you know, 15, 20, 25 minutes. Um, and, and certainly if you have questions, uh, stop me at any time, Deb. Uh, there are certainly uh, uh, chat lines as well that you can, you, can, you can pipe in on. And I can try to elaborate a little bit more if, if there's something that resonates with you. Um, so yeah, so the, the, fir the first C is around, is around uh, uh, of the Cs that Deb had mentioned, the five that we are gonna talk about very uh, sort of top line. Uh, the, fir the first C is communication. 
for those that know me, uh, know that the, my most important, so this, this particular one is number one for a reason. The other four, you can debate, you know, their level of importance. But this one to me is the most, most important. Uh, those folks that know me know that uh, I, I place a very, very, very high uh, um, importance on, on engagement and, and employee engagement. Uh, and, and for me, uh, especially right, right now, the communication that you have with your employees is going to be absolutely critical. It's absolutely critical that they understand and we're as transparent as, as leaders as possible in terms of what their future looks like. Uh, as an example, uh, my team here in the office, uh, I was very and have been very upfront with all the various scenarios, all the various changes, all the ways that we can potentially look to, um, you know, to, to move forward. Do I lay off? Do I not? Do we work at 75%? Do we not? How much is working from home? How much is not? What are the processes, the systems in place for people coming into our office or not? Uh, I think it's absolutely critical that everybody's uh, on the same page here because if you are currently not working as an employee, there is a tremendous amount of fear and a tremendous amount of uncertainty that you're feeling right now. Number one, if you are working, that's great, but there's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty and fear in terms of what the future is going to look like. And, and, and having uh, the, those honest conversations about where we're at, uh, they may not be pleasing and they may not be what we want to hear, but I think our employees need to hear it from us. Uh, and by doing that, by having that transparency, it certainly will create a higher level of engagement and loyalty. Uh, it's also uh, the right thing to do, in my opinion. Um, you know, everybody is afraid and uh, no one really knows kind of where things are at. So it, it does say that my, 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 my manager, my company, you know, cares about me being part of that, uh, part, of, part, of the, the, you know, part of the solution and part of the communication. So that's the first big bit around communication is that I think it's, it's, it's very, very important. We know these things, but if... If we haven't communicated, if we haven't touched base, if we haven't done um, virtual um, cocktail hour or whatever it is that you want to do, I think it's really, really important to stay close to your employees and, and engage with them um, in terms of what is happening down the road. That's number one. The second thing that uh, high level of communication uh, uh, mitigates uh, and or prevents is, is talent loss. So if you think about it right now, we've got some employees that are either working part time, reduced hours, not working at all. Um, if they feel that a disengagement, um, if they don't feel that they have all the all the information at their fingertips uh, and they're afraid to ask for it, um, then there is we do run the risk as as employers to potentially lose them in, in, a, in a few weeks and in, in a couple of months to other to other businesses and then for us to restart after all of this uh, becomes incrementally incrementally more more difficult and so really if you don't buy into the engagement thing at all which you know i do but if you don't buy into the engagement thing at all to preserve business continuity and to accelerate startup we have to ensure that the, our people are coming back and one way to ensure that is to keep them in the loop and to maintain that uh, that communication. So that's really kind of number one. Uh, Deb, do you have any uh, thoughts on that or any comments? Uh, can you hear me now? I can. Okay, perfect. Colton is just, it's like a, it's like a, a child with a new toy. It's just like, oh, look, I can make the screens go smaller, larger. I can hear you, I can't hear you. So, <laughs> um, I 100% I agree. Um, Communication, it seems such an easy thing to do, but I, I know with a lot of our clients and even us, I mean, I've never experienced working remote. I've never experienced trying to manage, you know, it's so much you can do to play into a video um, and have a discussion. When you're having a group discussion, you've got to be thinking about 12 people that are on the other side of this. So it does create challenges. I think this is a good thing. I, I will hope that there's patience in all levels because I don't think a lot of employers understood how important and how challenging this could be mm -hmm. 
going through these quotes. So here we are, we're in it. And so I guess what I would hope is that the love and the engagement is from both sides is that, you know, that we're all learning together. Um, do you do you feel, do you believe that? Because I know that there's always, you know, this, yeah. you know, from the management down, we should have this, you know, we should have this all together. Yeah. But do you see that there's almost like a, I hate to say for lack of better, as a buy-in of love to say, you know, like, I understand, like you guys didn't know how this all played out because we never role played a pandemic before. We don't know what this is all about. What, what are you hearing at your end? Well, no, I, I, I think we're definitely getting better at it. I think we've taken this for granted in the in-office space. And now we recognize how important it is to keep everybody in the loop. Uh, we've been forced to do it, and, and yeah. uh, you know we've obviously highlighted the reasons why. But I think it has raised the the awareness and the um, uh, the importance amongst uh, employers and, and, and management teams. Um, you know uh, why why it's important. So I, I you know I feel that it, it is happening. I just again as a point of note, it's important that we you know stay on top of it uh, for a lot of those reasons, especially keep people engaged and to get wrapped up and, and up and running as quickly as possible. Well, and and one of the things that we've done, Hanif, is that we, we've said like of every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we have this conversation and it's like a kind of like an 8.30, three minute video and it comes from various levels, HR management. Um, and you know what, I think, you know, it certainly helps keeps that connection. And then individually, we've all got our pockets. Mm -hmm that um, we've learned to, you know, you know, if it's just the benefits that get together, but then we get together as a team. So, you know what, it does, you work out a few kinks. I mean, people, people actually, it's kind of, it's kind of funny trying to figure out how some people's capabilities when it comes to even just working the, the technology. So we all can have a good laugh over it. Right. We really can. So, so yeah, absolutely a, a point well taken. The, the, other, thing I would, the yeah. other thing I would know, Deb, is it's not only staying in touch, but it's also keeping people apprised of the state of the union, kind of where we're going. And, and, and things are changing so quickly. I mean, we see the prime minister, we see Premier Mo having these um, sort of regularly scheduled check-ins in terms of where things are at and where we're going. I think that type of thing is also very, very important for businesses to have a regular check-in on the State of the Union and how the uh, how the plates are shifting and how the things are changed, how, how, how the outcomes are changing depending on kind of, you know, where we're at, so. And, and if on that note, like, is is it okay to have a conversation? Of course, we all want to keep it at the high level. Like, it's all like, we're going to get through. I get that. But there also has to be like, a, almost like a reality. Like, I mean, it's kind of like the good, bad and different conversation too, because you don't want to set people up for something that may not be what you can promise and do. And I know that, you know, like my common line is that I hate to be brutally honest, but this is what we've got to be thinking about. I, I, my general advice to managers is um, there's nothing wrong with being optimistic, but we have to be realistic. And, and we have to play both sides of that. I mean, um, you know, optimism is important, but we have to put in realism as well. And we have to be kind of honest about where things are at. And, um, you know, um, and, and, and that's not a bad thing. That's, that's just the reality of the situation. So, um, you know, if you truly care, it comes through anyway. And, and the realism is offset by the caring anyhow. So, um, you know, I, I think we can manage that that line. But it's true. Yeah, it can't be all you know, all roses and sunshine. And uh, we have to be honest about it. And 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 our employees respect us for that. Yeah. Uh, they respect us for being honest. You know, even though it's not always the the the, the conversations we like to hear. So, so that's communication. Uh, the first C of of, of the five. Um, the next C is 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 a, is a, is a one that is is kind of again uh, uh, one that doesn't get done very often. Uh, in my many years with uh, in in big pharma, uh, I would ask for a five year uh, sales plan. Boom, there it was, my five year sales plan done. Here's the you know here's the outlook. Here's the competitors. Here's the growth rates. Here's the market penetrations. Blah blah blah. I'd ask my five-year marketing plan, no problem. Here you go. This is the new competitive entrance. This is the market shares that we're looking at. These are the uh, the uh, the marketing trends that we're, we're seeing. Five years down the road, this is what we're projecting for, for marketing. But when I ask for a talent plan, my five-year talent plan, I get crickets. Nothing, nada. And so as we tend as, as businesses to be so in the moment and so market share now and get going now and what do we need now, that we forget that what is it going to look like three, four, five years from now, number one? And do we have the right people in place? Do we have the right systems in place? Do we have the right processes in place?
Do we have the right talent in place? Do we have the right skills in place? And are we cultivating those employees to fill those roles that are going to be where we're at five years from now? So it's tough to get people to think 30,000 feet and five years from now, especially right, right now when we have problems today that we're kind of going through. And so the way I look at it is this is the best time to actually have these conversations right, right now, because we are in unprecedented times. We are not at the office in many cases. Um, we are kind of removed almost from the, the, the phones ringing and the door people interrupting you and the, you know, knocking on doors. Do you have a minute? As, uh, as Pat, uh, as Pat Kyle often says, the, do you have a minute? And, so this actually is probably one of the best times for us to actually sit back and reflect on our capital planning, but specifically uh, our human capital planning. And so I want everybody out there to really sit back and take a look and, and get a sense of where are we going? Um, what is the current situation right now? And, uh, and be honest with yourself about you know, where are we? Um, and, and what have we learned now? that we've, we've done something that is relatively unprecedented, at least in my career, um, you know, and, and it seems like in, in many people's worlds, this is an unprecedented situation. So what are some key learnings that we can, we can glean from this? Uh, and let's, let's start talking about it. Um, are the current roles that we have actually valid? We tend to always fill, you know, people in these roles and we tend to get into these things but we don't actually sit back and go, wait a minute, you know, if I haven't changed this role in 10 years, I'm going to guarantee you something has changed in the last 10 years where that role has evolved. And so we may as well start identifying based on this new reality, based on people working from home, based on people, you know, based on what our, what our clients are going through. Um, what, what does that new role look like? And, and do we have the right people in place? And or do we need to train people uh, to get to get to those roles? So do they need to be changed? Now is an excellent time to do some self-reflection and what we're doing well and what we're doing poorly. Sometimes when we're in the thick of things, we're in the office and everything's kind of going around us, we tend not to see things objectively. Uh, it, it, you tend to see things a little bit differently when you're inside the fishbowl versus when you're outside the fishbowl. And right now, in many ways, we're outside the fishbowl. So let's ask ourselves really, what are we doing well? And what are we doing poorly? Um, what are the functions or what are the job functions? What are the roles? What are the, uh, the tasks that we need to improve on? What are the tasks that we continue doing? And what are the tasks that we should stop? Um, and I will, I will show you a little later that these things are already happening at a very, very high level, at a CFO level already, where the new reality of what our jobs are going to look like um, is going to change. Um, you know, um, is it going to last six months? Is it going to last year? I don't know. But the post-COVID world, business is going to change, and the way we staff our business is going to change. Do does everybody need, in in my business need to be permanent full time? I don't know. Or do we have a flexible field force or a flex a flexible workforce that can scale up and scale down, uh, scale you know depending on the situation. Uh, what, what COVID has taught us is, you know, well, maybe we need some flexibility built in there because we can't just hire people and then let them go again and then hire them and let them go. And so then there may need to be some scalability in certain functions. So again, as a, as, as a management team, we need to start asking, our question, asking the questions, is this the right way to go forward? And, and that really, um, is, it's a tough question to ask, but I think being outside of the fishbowl right now, uh, allows us to ask some of these questions. So these questions start to form the foundations of your human capital plan in the next two, three, four, five years. Where do you need to go? What are some of the skills that you need to train for? Uh, how do we promote the folks that we need to promote? Uh, are there people interested in those roles? And these are all questions that we have to, 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 to start laying the foundation for so that in five years from now, um, you know, we, we, have a, we have a solid... Uh, uh, a solid legacy and a solid future, um, you know, as, as we progress through uh, through business. Does that make sense, Deb? Oh, um, absolutely, yeah. Um, 
one of the things, because you know, obviously, in, in Hanif has been so um, gracious to be part of our past uh, seminars and, and having a, a role in, in, a, in a, uh, a session with others involved. And we get into this human capital piece because part of what we've been trying to do, and you know, this Hanif is when we're looking at benefits, we, we're looking not in a silo of benefits, we're trying to look at this, you know, this holistic approach and human capital is like one of the criticals in this approach. And, you know, yes, we need to look at well-being and yes, we need to look at managing, you know, um, disability and, and wellness, but HR and human capital becomes really important. I mean, if you think about what changed things really quickly for an industry, look at my, look at our clients that are in the healthcare field. Like right. did they think that today it was going to be just and only about virtual care. Now, just because COVID said we got to do this, we got to move it really fast. Does that mean that tomorrow, when everything goes back to normal, they go back to normal? Right. Because I don't think so. They've yeah. just now taken on this new movement of what their business model is going to look like going forward, and so have we, in to some degrees. Because to your point, you 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 almost can get there's like a clarity when you're looking at things now because um, it's heightened. And, and, and yes, I, I agree. We have to be looking at it now because now, now we've been tested at the ultimate, le ultimate level. And, and now we need to be really thinking this through so that when life does go back to normal weeks, months from now, um, what's it going to look like? Cause I mean, right. go back to the quote, we have to adapt. Things have right. been different and maybe we've seen it there, but we've never dealt with it. But now yeah. we have no Absolutely. choice but to deal with it. You know, Deb, in, in a strange way, we've been forced to beta test a new a new system, yeah. a, new, a new way of working, a new way of thinking. Uh, we've talked about, we always talk about beta testing it, but now we've been forced to do it. And, and the whole idea of a beta test is to actually do a postmortem and say what's working and what's not working, right? Absolutely. So we've been forced to do that beta test. Well, and one of the things that, you know, like obviously with technology is coming fast and furious into our business, but, um, you know, one thing, let's just take, for example, virtual telemedicine. And I remember having this conversation, you know, not very long ago, really, six months ago, and people still thinking, no, you can't do that. You can't have a conversation with a doctor on the phone. What could they really do for you? And yet here we are. And is that going to go away anytime soon? No, it's not. So, I mean, I've always gravitated to these new progressions and, and, uh, uh, I think that's really going to be important in any industry. doesn't matter what industry. In the food industry, they're going to evolve to a whole different level of how they would do in business. So interesting points. Carry on. So when you, we are sort of looking at our human capital plan and we're looking at what's working and what's not working and do we have, um, you know, what are the roles going to look like and how are we going to change the role to adapt? Um, working remotely, for example, is one adaptation that may happen. And I'm going to show you some data very shortly um, that suggests it's going to become more the norm than, than the exception moving forward. But, you know, we once we start looking at these sorts of things, uh, when we're specifically looking at our people and when we're specifically evaluating our people, and if we don't have a formal evaluation process, get one. Find somebody that can that can that can help you uh, with a formal performance evaluation or a yearly evaluation process, because these are the things that are going to start to come out of this evaluation process. The first thing is capabilities, employee capabilities. So what is what is that? We kind of know what it is. There's really there's one is capabilities and one is capacity. I'm going to get into both of those very, very briefly. So capabilities refer to the employee's ability to perform the work expected of them to the required standards. Now, this may be skill, it may be aptitude, it may be uh, other, other things, but really what, what the capabilities are is what can an employee do well, okay? So it's kind of more around the quality of, the, of, of, of what they bring to the table. So as you start to look at your human capital plan, start assessing employee capabilities. These are, this is very, very important. But capabilities are only one one part of that, that equation. Capabilities are what they're able to perform well. The second part of that is capacity. So capabilities are what you can do well. Capacity is how much of it can you do. Uh, and so we talk about capacity building and capacity building or capacity is the process by which individuals and organizations begin to improve and become more efficient 
uh, improve their skills, improve the tools, improve the processes. Um, working remotely, for example, if this becomes the norm, one way to improve capacity would be to improve your IT structure, uh, improve your, your 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 team norms when you're working in a in a um, a, a virtual meeting setting. These would be ways of improving capacity. But not only that, but also ways of improving capacity in terms of volume. How do we increase our volume of clients seeing, client service? So these, both of these concepts are, 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 are absolutely integral when looking at evaluating your, your employees' capabilities and what they can do and how well they can do it, number one, and capacity uh, to what level of efficiency and and they can do it so one is kind of a quality thing and one's a quantity thing um, and it's very very important we understand that now i came across a really really interesting survey uh we're talking about capacity and i said earlier that the the the, the post covid world is going to look different for for us and people said to me well honey if you know you're being very you know um, yeah, grand about it and you know you're delusional it's not going to change that much and, I, I personally think it's going to change. And so I, I was doing some research and I came across um, a very unique survey here done by a Gartner. And I'm going to I have a link here. So Colton, I'm going to try to click the link uh, to show you the actual data. But Gartner is a, uh, is a company that does, mark, uh, that does market research for S&P 500 companies in the States. So this is uh, out of, uh, I believe it's out of uh, Virginia. And uh, what Gartner, Gartner did was they surveyed 317 CFOs. And they asked these CFOs, you know, in, in light of kind of working remotely and some of these other changes, what is the intention after we kind of reintroduce normality again back into our, our work world? And what was fascinating is that 74% of the CFOs said that in some way, shape, or form, they intend to shift some employees to work from home remotely. So that was like blew me away. Uh, that this, this beta test that we've all gone through, North America globally, has actually resulted in an output that at least 75% of high level CFOs are saying that there is something to not being in the office and there is something to being at work. So I'm gonna try to click the link here and um, I hope it'll it'll work. Um, just give me one second. Colton, tell me if you can see this. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to show you a graphic. So Gartner is out of Arlington, Virginia. This just came out. This is April 3rd, 2020. And I'm going to share this graphic here. This I'm going to sort of show it to you. Can you see my mouse? This graphic here. And what this graphic shows is that of those 317 CFOs that were asked, you know, what's going to happen with, with remote individuals, 26% um, nothing's going to change. Uh, but 5% or 27% said that 5% of our permanent employees are going to remain at home permanently. 5%, one in 20 of our employees are going to stay at home permanently. That was a quarter of the CFOs. The other quarter of their CFOs said 10% are going to stay home. Um, that's one in 10. And an additional 20% said one in five of my permanent employees are going to stay at home. Uh, and then uh, a, a much lower number, one in 25 said, uh, you know, 50% of my employees are going to stay at home. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is, and this is just the beta test that we've been, we've been forced to live through. And these high level CFOs are seeing fundamental changes that are moving forward in their business. Now, if I asked you six months ago, if I asked you not even three months in January, if I asked you three months ago, what proportion do you think of, 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 of staff members would ever work from home in our current business model? I, I'm guessing we would probably have had a very, very different number than what I just showed you. So things are changing and, and we have to recognize 
that this is just one aspect. The, the remote is one aspect. There are going to be other aspects. Just that simple remote change changes the capabilities requirement and changes the capacity requirement that an organization needs to undergo. Just that one change. So we have to evolve. And back to your point, Deb, those that survive evolve. And this is part of the evolution that we need to start the process on. But we need to get a sense of where that evolution is going. And so these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. Thoughts? It's interesting. It's not to say this is new. It's just moved much more quickly. I agree with you. Um, I think some, what we're finding where, yes, we've been forced into remote, all of us. Um, I think we're finding that some people will maybe feel that that is a better space for them. Maybe some are saying, I'm that person that always has to come to the office. I mean, we're very grateful that we're in essential service right now. So if everybody's wondering why we're at the office, um, we're here because we're an essential service. But that said, we've given everybody the choice to stay home. And that said, a couple are, are saying, I am like, this is working for me. Others are saying, it's just not working for me. So it'll be interesting to see, and, and I agree this is where it's going to go, because we've always been talking about, you know, like this work balance, life balance, life balance, right? And and how, you know, how do we do this and, and get full productivity out of people and yet people still have lives to live and, and where is that best space for them? And everybody's going to have to be accountable to their own being to say, is this a good space for me or am I better over here? So you hope those conversations keep moving back and forth mm -hmm. and, and I believe they will and, and the organizations that are going to start to move into this space because they were, we've got, I know for ourselves, we've got two job sharing um, or like shortened weeks and we've done it because it just totally makes sense and it works for us. Not every organization can move into a three day a week, a three day a week worker. Maybe it's just based on the role they play, they can't, but, uh, but everybody's adapting. Everybody's right. adapting and, and there's going to be that, that need for moving into that more flexible space um, right. that allows people to be at their maximum potential. And, and is it going to be a movement where we're going to try things on for size? You know, we have to, it, I think it will be like you, we, if we could just turn a switch and say, here's what the perfect next model is going to look like. I, I think we'd be fooling ourselves. Um, and would the employees be fooling themselves? You know, cause we've had a couple employees that says, you know, like it, if I'm able to, I'm coming back to work. Cause this is my environment. I work best in yet. The other ones might say I'm, I'm better off in this space. So I'm encouraged by the movement and by the stats that are coming out because I know that, you know, we've come a little bit from that traditional model where we have that structure of 8 to 4.30. And again, some rules have to be in that rule of structure, but some don't. And so how do you make that all work for an organization? And every company and every industry, every industry is going to play out a little bit differently. And and it's it's going to be like kind of like trying out for the, you know, for the for the show is that we're going to try things out for size. It might not work. We might fall a couple times. But let's all just forgive each other for this process because um, because we didn't get a lot of time to plan it like based on the COVID. So I think I think this is the first start of everybody going. Let's do this. It makes right. sense. It does make sense for sure. Excellent. So yeah, no, it completely makes sense. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go through the next couple of slides very quickly. Obviously, uh, our businesses don't survive without our people and our businesses don't survive without our customers. And so we can talk, you know, we're, we are talking talent planning, but I think it's very, very important as part of our talent planning to get a sense of what our customers are saying about where their business is going. We need to continue to engage our customers. This is, we all know this. This is part of what we're doing now. It's part of what a lot of folks are doing through other ways. We need to engage our customers. We need to stay relevant. We need to stay on top of things, but more importantly, we need to understand what, how their realities have changed so we can respond accordingly. And this is, you know, our, our the success of our collective businesses are going to be on our ability to, in some ways, sort of foresee the future. But the way we're going to foresee the future is we're going to ask our clients what their current realities are like and what their futures are going to look like so that we can start to adapt and respond in ways that are consistent, consistent to our customers. The other point on this slide that I think is important is that we have two sets of customers, too. We have to remember that. We have external customers, which are traditionally the way we look at customers, but we have internal customers. And some employees within our organizations are actually uh, customers to other employees within our, our organizations. Um, they may support, or they you know, uh, work within the, within the organizational frame. So we do have to have engagement and stay close to both sets of customers. And I think it's, it's very important that we, that we do that. 
the last thing I, I guess I'll, 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 I'll touch on, and it's a more of a shameless plug, uh, but I think it's very important, um, is in order for us to build our capabilities and our capacities, every single one of us, we're all leaders, um, needs to improve our, take this time to improve our skill sets. Uh, it could be coping systems and managements. It could be stress management. Uh, it could be physical uh, in nature, for sure. Uh, but there's also some, there's lots and lots of ways of getting involved with leadership programs and taking the time now to, 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 to learn more skills at, at hand. And we're very proud uh, to be able to offer something for free uh, to, uh, to you, Deb, to your clients, uh, and to anybody that's interested. Um, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's by WebEx, it's by simulcast. Uh, it's a complimentary simulcast. It's featuring two very, very well-known speakers. Uh, most have heard of Simon Sinek. A uh, few may have heard of Amy uh, Cuddy. Both Simon Sinek and Amy Cuddy are uh, one of the TED Talks most watched speakers, uh, and um, they are um, they're they're presenting uh, by WebEx. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm covering all the costs for it. The only thing I request, and it's purely voluntary, is a ten dollar donation to the food bank. If you're interested in watching this. Uh, you can register at expressbros.com slash express talks. If you need more information, get a hold of me uh, or Deb, and uh, she can forward you on to my, my, uh, my website. If you are somebody that's in HR, we were also able to get it credited for two hours of HR credits. So take advantage of, of, of leadership opportunities right now while you have, while the phone isn't ringing and while the, you know, the, uh, do you have a minutes are not happening. Take some time to, to, to build up your own capacity and your own capabilities through whatever um, you know leadership opportunities you have and as i mentioned um, there are also many uh physio programs um debbie referenced uh i think it was warman physio i have some friends also in the physio space where they will educate your employees via telehealth on on taking care of themselves while they're working remotely uh, one of my physio friends was saying to me that recently uh, she's noticed that people are coming in with shoulder pain and back pain and um, because we have transplanted people from a office environment to a home environment where ergonomically they're not um, designed to work from. So there may be some issues that are going to be that may come out of this. So I think taking care of yourself physically and making sure that you stay close to your employees that are working in a makeshift office, uh, getting some physical, um, you know, uh, consider uh, some something like a, an assessment will be something that 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 is very important. It's also important, and Deb, we were talking about this earlier. You know, what what how does it affect disability and and and, and in terms of benefits working from home? And if I'm in a, in a poor ergonomic posture, how does it help WC? How does it affect WCB? You know, is there a duty to accommodate an employee? that is working from home? I, I don't know the answers to it, but these are some interesting questions that we've never really had to address, but now they're coming up. Again, beta tested, and now it's these are some of the, the challenges that are coming out of that. If we don't have, if we have an employee working on the couch, um, it's gonna affect them physically. Um, that may also affect your business and their ability to come back, both financially and um, you know from an from an actual job performance standpoint as well. So these are all considerations when we're starting to you know look at you know the talent plan. Um, so that's really kind of what I what I you know sort of the, the questions I had sort of from my perspective, and I guess the idea really from my sort of approach to this, Deb, was that if a lot of this stuff is rocket, you know, it's not rocket science. We intuitively know this, but sometimes when you hear it kind of from a, a different perspective, um, it kind of gets the light bulb going like, hey, you know what, maybe I should look into that and maybe I should take that opportunity to, to start asking some of these questions in a more formal way than we traditionally have done. So if, you know, you got something out of it that sort of spurs you to go, you know what, maybe that, that's worth looking at. Then I, you know, I, I think it was well worth the uh, the time uh, that we uh, that we spent it. Yeah. No, I. You know what? 
you never have to apologize for the things that we should be hearing again and again and again. I mean, you know what? At the end of the day, we need to be reminded and we have to focus back in. So you got some great points. I mean, thank you for sharing that that webinar with us. I mean, absolutely, we're going to join in and we'll be sharing it, Hanif, to our audience. Um, like all of our sessions, they'll be posted on our Facebook and then we have a newsletter. It will be going out through the newsletter um, as well. And I encourage everybody because, as Hanif said, this is the time to take a step back and to reevaluate what things you're doing, what things we could be doing differently, what things can we improve on, which things we need to change. And I'm really excited and we're still going to carry on, Hanif. I know that prior to COVID, we were going to, we were having you come in and do sessions for our, our leadership team. Mm -hmm. And um, we've even shared to some level, really through our seminars, um, just even, it doesn't have to be just from the leadership team. I mean, whatever you share, honestly, I think you could take it right down to someone's own well-being and own personal challenges that they have uh, and, and, and goals that they want to set because we all have to take ownership in what it is we want to do with our world um, and how we're going to live it and play it out and how it's going to play into that employer-employee um, perspective as well. So um, personal development is everything. And I think we're all learning a lot about our own personal uh, our, our own personal self right now and what we need to do differently. And yes, we need to be accountable to our health right now, people, because um, it's what is going to keep us healthy and allow us to be productive in the workplace when we get back to that normal. So that 20 minute walk at the coffee break in the residential area might be much more enjoyable than downtown Saskatoon. So take advantage of it. Get out, take 20 minutes, clear the head, get back to that nice, comfortable ergonomic chair and get back to work. <laughs> are, there, are there any questions, Steph? I know we've been, you know what? You've been so good that, I mean, there might be questions after and absolutely we would take them sure. and um, we'd be more than happy to share them with you and then we can disperse it back out through our, our Facebook, maybe just to our, our private chat. I'm gonna just now say thank you, Hanif, for yeah. uh, sharing your wisdom and and I, I, real, I really enjoyed it and I know the audience did. And yes, questions are welcomed. Um, we've got a couple of things we're going to wrap up um, as part of, you know, our Thursday live session. Um, we will be here next week. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping, um, and you had mentioned the ergonomics. So, you know, shout out to Bridges because we're hoping that they're going to be, they're one of our preferred partners. They're going to be our next guest appearance next week. Um, that said, we've got someone in the, um, the wellness space, the physio wellness space. I think it's really good that she comes and has a chat with us. So we've got about three or four lined up. It's just a question of timing for everybody. Which one can, and you thank you. you, you like pulled this together in about three days. <laughs> so this is how we're all working right now. We're just like, we're just like going like that. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Um, there is a private chat. I know, um, Hanif, we shared with you and you've joined. So what we've done with this private chat, Colton, do you want to maybe share with the crowd really quickly? Yeah, do you want me to kind of sure. off? slide over here. So again, thanks to Hanif for, for joining us today. He bared with me yesterday while we got everything set up with this new platform to bring in a guest speaker. Hanif, you had one comment that just said this was fantastic. I noticed someone else while you were speaking earlier tagged, I presume, a colleague or a friend to get them in on watching the video too. So like Deb said, if there's any other questions, we'll, we'll tune you in. But I'm going to take you off the screen for now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Hanif. See you guys. Keep well. And the last things to mention are just that a uh, couple of resources. We obviously are doing our webinar every week, but uh, I'm part of one coming up on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So if you're looking for content and good information, Sipe and Innovation Place are both hosting different types of webinars and things that they're doing through their organizations now. Uh, the one with Sipe is called this Patrick Kucha, I think I'm pronouncing that right, style of presentations. They're like 20 seconds long. Uh, slides and 20 slides, so six minute presentations, and they go through five of them usually in a go. And the topic is cannabis. And then at Innovation Place, there the one that I'm doing with them is about uh, financial literacy, financial planning through these types of times. So again, those are both two great resources. I know they're hosting tons of different webinars and lots of different content. So definitely take a look uh, at what people are doing because we only have tons of time now. We only have uh, more time on our screens and uh, we want to maximize that if we can. And uh, otherwise, just thanks everyone for joining. I see Mike said, excellent commentary, presentation, lots of ideas to reflect on. And thanks, Mike, you're always a great fan. Thanks, and again, Mike. tune in next week. So bye from Ryan.
chat? Uh, yeah, the link for the private group is in this post. So please click there if you want to join. We have comments from other business owners and managers and leaders and things like that. So if you're looking for people to bounce ideas off of and get resources from other people like Hanif, uh, like us, Bridges, other places, we're hoping to build that up as we keep going through these times. Thanks again for joining, everyone. Thank you.